Hello everybody, so we're back for another bedtime story and this week I'm going to continue reading Oliver and the Sea Wig and today I'm going to read you chapters 2 and 3. So to recap what's happened so far, have a little think and tell your mums or your dads, your brothers and sisters what has happened so far. Pause the video and I'll be back to tell you in a minute. So I'm sure you're all able to tell me what happened, but Oliver has just discovered his parents have gone missing. So they're explorers and they think they've explored everywhere, but they arrive home and they see these islands that they've never seen before. So Oliver goes into the house, he unpacks because he's so excited to be home, whereas his parents rush off to explore these new islands. But Oliver can't seem to find them and the islands have disappeared. So I wonder what's happened. Let's find out. Chapter two. Most people would be a bit alarmed to find that their parents had disappeared along with a whole bunch of uncharted islands. They might feel inclined to phone the police or the coast guard or just run about shouting. Not Oliver. He was a crisp and made a sterner and was made of sterner stuff than that. He hadn't panicked when his baby buggy was carried off by an eagle on the expedition of the forgotten Mazer. He hadn't lost his cool when his parents took him on that ill-advised cycling trip around the crater of Mount Firebelly. But it's supposed to be an extinct volcano, Daddy had yelled while lava bombs bounced off their cycling helmets. He had barely battered an eyelid when a bear stole his sleeping bag on the north face of Mount Rainer. He barely battered one now, just ran downstairs and out onto the beach, looking around in case his parents had come ashore without him noticing. But the beach, in its wintry afternoon sun, was long and empty and completely parent-free. The orange dinghy rasped against the sand, down on the foreshore where the small waves kept spreading neat doilies of foam under it. Oliver pulled it further up the beach and wondered what to do. Then he noticed that there was still one island left in the bay. It was the littlest and lowest and least interesting of them all. The one his mum and dad had just ignored when they went motoring off to explore the taller ones. Even from the shore with the low sun shining in his eyes, Oliver could see that they were not there. But perhaps it held some clue as to where they had gone. He ran back to the Explormobile and packed a rucksack with useful things. He then locked the house up and put a note on the front door which read, Back soon. How he hoped he would be. He scampered to where the dinghy waited and shoved it out into the sea again. Whap, whap, wet the waves, slapping its blunt, blunt orange nose. Oliver heaved himself aboard. He couldn't work the outboard motor because his arms weren't strong enough to tug the starter cord but there were oars stowed neatly on the bottom boards and he pulled them out and started rowing. It didn't take him long to reach the island where he pulled the dinghy up on the sheltered shoreward side. Shoreward side. The island was just as small as it had looked from the beach. Clumps of greyish grass sighed softly as the sea wind stirred them. There were snaggles of driftwood, festoons of weed and lengths of old tarred rope. There was a ramshackle heap of twigs balanced on a pile of boulders which were the highest place on the island. That was all. It took Oliver less than a minute to walk right across the island to the far shore where he stood looking out to sea. All his hopes of finding clues faded like the foam which was kept washing around his toes and melting into the wet sand. Mum! he shouted. Dad! The echoes came back at him from the cliffs around the bay. Echoes, but no reply. Mum! he shouted louder still. Dad! Oh, put a sock in it, won't you? grumbled a creaky voice behind him. Some of us are trying to sleep. A pair of beady blue eyes were glaring at Oliver over the brim of that twig heap on the island's crown. The heap was a nest and the eyes belonged to the bird who owned it. But birds don't talk, protested Oliver. Parrots do, the bird said. Not really, not properly, Oliver pro protested. And anyway, you're not a parrot. 
Indeed I'm not, the bird sniffed. It stood up in its nest and spread its enormous dirty white wings. I am a wandering albatross. Diomedia exulians. Though you may call me Mr Culpepper, and now that you have you had best get back to shore or you will be wondering too. What does that mean? wondered Oliver. Tch, said the boy. Don't they teach you youngsters anything these days? Not all islands stay stay where you put them. Some move about. Here one minute, gone the next. This is one of them. That's why I nested on it, of course. I'm not stupid. Why go flapping about the world when you can just roost here and let the island do the wandering? Oliver looked down at the island. Between his feet he saw rock, sand, grit, dune grass and ground down seashells. It didn't look as if it were going anywhere. How do they move? he asked. Who cares? said Mr Culpepper, shrugging his wings. Where are they going? Who knows? said Mr Culpepper. But all the others have gone already, so this one won't stay much longer. As he spoke, the island shuddered. Small stones spilled and rattled, trickling down. Hop in your boat and be off with you, said the albatross. No, said Oliver. Not me. I'm staying. Wherever those islands went, I must go too. My mum and dad were on them, you see. That noisy couple, said Mr Culpepper. Suit yourself, but you'd be better off without them. If you want my opinion. Oliver wasn't listening any more. The island lurched, almost throwing him, him off his feet. He crouched down. He curled his fingers and toes in the sand like roots, clinging on. The island sank a little. Water bubbled whitely around the edges. Then it turned slowly around and started to move out of Deepwater Bay, following the golden pathway that the evening sun had painted on the waves. As soon as he was used to the movement, Oliver ran around to where he'd left the boat and made sure it was still safe above the tide line. Looking back, he watched the shore fall swiftly behind. A fiery shard of the sunset reflected off for a moment from the window of his own bedroom and he felt very sad that he would not be sleeping there that night. He almost l launched the boat and rowed back to the beach. It was not too far, not quite, not yet, but there would be no point in going home without mum and dad. Without them, it wasn't really a home at all. So he turned his back on it and watched the sun dip down into the western sea and ate a sandwich. What's that you're eating? asked Mr Culpepper. Tuna mayonnaise, said Oliver. The albatross snorted. New fangled muck. He spread his wings and soared out over the ocean in the twilight, dipping down to snatch a fish out of the waves. Oliver sat watching the empty sea, hoping for a glimpse of the other islands. He watched until it grew too dark. To see anything at all, then curled up in the grassy space among the rocks, put his rucksack under his head for a pillow and slept. All through the night the island kept moving. Oliver stepped soundly, soothed by the island's steady motion and the snore of the sea upon its shores. Then through his dreams he heard another sound. Doof! it went, and ow! Oliver sprang awake. The sky was a, the p palest grey and a few last stars were fading. A wind from the west whispered the grasses. Bother, said something nearby. It wasn't Mr Culpepper. The albatross was sleeping still, safe in its scruffy nest with his head stuffed under his wings. Mum, said Oliver hopefully. Dad? He clambered up over the rocks to the beach. There on the shore sat a mermaid, rubbing her nose. Who put this island here, she said. Not me, said Oliver. He had never seen a mermaid before. In fact, he had thought about, he had thought they were just in stories. But then he'd never seen a moving island or a talking diomedia till yesterday. So he wasn't as surprised as he might have been. The mermaid seemed to be about his own age and she was starting to get a black eye. There I was, swimming along, minding my own business, she said. And suddenly there's an island in the way. It's a danger to sh it's a danger to shipping. That's what it is. It's a wonder I wasn't knocked unconscious. 
Have you seen any other islands? asked Oliver. My mum and dad are on one. I'm looking for them. Sorry, said the mermaid. I didn't even see this one. My eyesight isn't very good and I can hardly see you. Come over here, you're just a blur. Oliver went closer. The mermaid frowned at him with vague blue eyes. Well, she said, you're an odd looking character. Oliver thought that seemed pretty rich coming from someone who was at, at least half fish, but he was a polite boy and did not try to argue. Instead, he said, my name's Oliver. Mine's Iris, said the mermaid. You don't know any place called Farsight Cove, do you? I was told there's a beach optician there. That's where I'm going when your silly island got in my way. This was not the first time her short-sightedness has got Iris into trouble. Apart from anything else, it made other mermaids laugh at her. Well, it was one of the things that made them laugh. All her sisters and cousins were beautiful creatures with eyesight as clear as their singing voices. And they liked to sit on rocks with, with comb in one hand and a mirror in the other and sing eerie songs as passing sa at passing sailors. Perhaps it was because mermen were all rather dull, stay-at-home sorts who didn't much like mermaids company and preferred to lounge up about in their grottos reading newspapers and discussing the latest finball results. At any rate, the mermaid enjoyed the thought of all those sailors going home and telling everyone about the lovely mermaids who had sung to them and been haunted by their singing ever after. Iris was nothing like that. She was rather plump and she could never remember where she'd put her comb and mirror. She couldn't see the point of sitting on rocks and cutter waddling all day. The one time she tried singing to a handsome fisherman in his boat, it had turned out not to be a handsome fisherman or a boat at all, just a passing walrus. Sorry, she told it. From a distance, you look like a little brown boat with a man sitting in it. Hmm, said the walrus. You need to get your eyes tested, dear. And it told her about the beach optician at Farsight Cove. Oliver had heard about this beach optician too. He remembered his mum and dad talking about the dotty old man who wheeled his barrow of eye charts, instruments and glasses down the path to the cove each day and sat there on the sand waiting for mermaids. They had laughed and shaken their heads because they didn't believe in mermaids. Oliver looked hard at Iris and decided that there was no way he couldn't believe her. Farsight Cove is quite close to Deepwater Bay, he told her, but they must be both be miles and miles away by now. This island is moving, you see. It's been moving all night. Of course it has, said Iris. It's one of the Rambling Isles. The what? The Rambling Isles. They're not really islands at all. They're alive, although they're made of stone. They wander the oceans and they're always getting mistaken for ordinary islands. But really, they're more like very big stony giants. Oh, said Oliver. Well, where is it going? How on earth should I know? asked Iris. You really do say the same, the strangest things. I expect it's just rambling around, collecting stuff. That's what rambling isles do. But I suppose you could always ask it. Oliver looked around, bewildered. How could he ask rocks and stones and grass where they were going? Well, he could ask them, but how would, could he expect them to reply? Oh, I'll do it, said Iris wearily. She slapped the nearest rock as hard as she could. Hello, she shouted. The movement of the island changed. It slowed and turned from side to side. Mr Culpepper woke with a squawk and demanded to know what was happening. Slowly, the island lifted from the sea. There was a rush and a gurgle of falling water draining from its edges. It rose cliff high and the waves rolled past it, far below. Oliver went to its, to its raggedy edge and looked over. He saw that the island was really just the top of a vast, stony head. The grass was its hair. Water ran down its face, limpets scrubbed to its cheeks, seaweed and old carrier bags were tangled in its bushy eyebrows. Two big eyes peered up at Oliver.